So we'll begin, I think. Um, and good afternoon and welcome to this pop-up session that's hosted by us here at Quadrant Chambers on the Supreme Court's recent decision in Halliburton and Chubb. We've assembled a wonderful panel of speakers to discuss the judgment and I'll introduce them in a moment. But first, to provide a proper platform for the discussion, let me just outline the facts of the case for those of you who aren't so familiar with it. Halliburton and Chubb is about the appointment of an arbitrator in multiple arbitrations arising out of the same incident with one common party. It's about the duty to make disclosures in that scenario and the consequences of a failure to do so. And the incident in question was the Deepwater Horizon disaster in April 2010 involving the blowout of a well on the Deepwater Horizon rig in the Gulf of Mexico. This led to the loss of lives of several rig workers, substantial oil contamination and the collapse of the rig itself. The incident resulted in substantial damages claims by the US government against BP, who were leasing the rig, Transocean, who owned and operated it, and Halliburton, who were responsible for cementing and well monitoring. The settlement of these claims led to disputes between the companies and their insurers, one of whom was Chubb, and consequently to arbitrations of those disputes. In June 2015, Mr. Kenneth Rokerson QC, a very experienced English arbitrator, was appointed by the High Court to chair the arbitration between Halliburton and Chubb. In December 2015 and August 2016, he, appointed, uh, he accepted appointments in two further arbitrations arising out of the same fact, including one as Chubb's appointee. However, he didn't disclose the subsequent appointments to Halliburton, and Halliburton discovered them only a few months later in November 2016. It inquired about them then, and at that point, Mr. Rokerson responded by email explaining that it may have been an oversight, but he didn't think he had any disclosures to make. Halliburton applied to the High Court for Mr. Rokerson's removal from the tribunal. But in the High Court, Mr. Justice Popperwell at first instance dismissed the application at a hearing in January 2017, finding that in his view, there was indeed nothing which had to be disclosed, as there was no reason to suppose that the different evidence and argument Mr. Rokeson would encounter in another case would affect his ability to fulfill his duties in the Halliburton reference with an open mind. Following that decision, the Halliburton Chubb Tribunal went on to render a partial final award on the merits in Chubb's favor in December 17. In the following year, the cause for appeal dismissed Halliburton's appeal on the application to remove finding that the non-disclosure did not of itself justify an inference of apparent bias. Something more, it said, was required. So that brings us to 27th November 2020 and the decision of the Supreme Court unanimously dismissing the further appeal. In doing so, the Supreme Court found that the arbitration gave rise to a legal duty on arbitrators to make disclosure of such matters which would otherwise cause them to be in breach of their statutory obligation of fairness. Mr. Rickson had breached that duty by failing to disclose his appointments in the second and third references. But, the Supreme Court concluded, um, a fair-minded and informed observer would not have concluded that there was a real possibility of bias as at the date of the hearing of the removal application, taking everything into account, including Mr. Rickson's explanation to Halliburton of his failure to disclose. Now, the Supreme Court's decision brings finality on the issue of the arbitrator's duty um, of fairness under English law. However, the decision has raised eyebrows in some quarters on account of certain aspects of the court's analysis. So to the panel today, and I'm thrilled to be joined firstly by Constantine Partizides QC of Three Crowns. He's acted in some of the most significant arbitrations over the last two decades, frequently appearing for or against state in multi-billion dollar disputes. We're particularly fortunate to have Constantine with us today because he led the submissions for the ICC court as an intervening party in this case uh, at the hearing before the Supreme Court. Next, we have Claire Ambrose of 20 Essex Chambers, who practices as an arbitrator with over 200 appointments in international arbitrations under all major institutional rules. She frequently lectures on arbitration issues and is a co-author of the leading textbook on shipping arbitration. Philippa Charles is the head of international arbitration at Stewart's Law and brings us 20 years of experience in proceedings before all of the major arbitral institutions. She's active for clients including major global corporations in the aviation, pharmaceutical, power, oil and gas industries and many others. And she's a solicitor advocate who also sits as an arbitrator. Simon Rainey QC is my colleague here at Quadrant and is the Bar Legal 500's 2020 International Arbitration QC of the Year. Simon has also appeared as leading counsel in disputes administered by all of the major commercial arbitral institutions and regularly sits as an arbitrator. 
In addition, Simon frequently appears as an advocate before the Supreme Court. So with that fairly lengthy introduction out of the way, let's hear from our panel. Perhaps, Constantine, I could begin with you and get your view of the court's decision on the big question, I suppose. Was the court right not to remove Mr. Rokerson and set aside the award effectively? Well, that's uh, thank you, Gaurav, and thank you to you and Quadrant for the invitation. Um, that's cutting to the chase, but I think there's much to discuss in this award before we get to the outcome. And my starting point is just to remind myself how we all felt when we read the Court of Appeals decision uh, in this matter uh, and the level of disquiet that that caused amongst many of us that English law had taken a different course, uh, perhaps a course that wasn't consistent with uh, what are now prevailing international standards. When I, when I review the decision that's just been rendered by the Supreme Court against that backdrop, I think there's much to welcome. Uh, I think there's much to welcome in the way in which uh, the Supreme Court went about clarifying the Court of Appeals decision. Uh, I think there's much to welcome in the way in which they went, in my view, a little further than the Court of Appeal uh, on two of the key issues that certainly led the ICC to intervene in this matter. Uh, and what I liked in particular was their starting point, because they began their judgment with a a very realistic appraisal uh, of the difference in the role of an arbitrator as compared to a judge. And there's a paragraph which, um, to my mind, really sticks out and informs a lot of the discussion that follows at paragraph 59 of the judgment, in which the Supreme Court said this, um, in distinguishing the position of an arbitrator uh, from a judge, they drew attention to the remuneration uh, relationship that exists between an arbitrator and the parties, the fact that an arbitrator does have a financial interest in more appointments. Uh, the fact that for many arbitrators, uh, they depend for, to a significant degree uh, on the livelihood and further appointments. And therefore, and I thought this was a, a notable sentence, uh, that many arbitrators may have an interest in avoiding action which would alienate the parties uh, to an arbitration. Uh, and um, that, I think rather realistic appraisal of the position of an arbitrator informed the way in which the court went about addressing the two key questions of principle um, in the appeal that certainly led the ICC to intervene. The first of those two questions was whether or not um, it would be enough uh, for an arbitrator to accept appointment in uh, multiple cases that were interrelated with only one common party. Um, to show an appearance of bias. Uh, the, the Court of Appeal was rather uh, equivocal about that. And indeed, our reading of the Court of Appeal's uh, decision suggested that that wouldn't be enough in and of itself. And so the submission we made on behalf of the ICC was, if that was what the Court of Appeal meant, then it should be clarified. And the Supreme Court has indeed clarified that multiple appointments in interrelated matters in the right circumstances can in and of itself be enough to establish uh, an appearance uh, of bias. On the second question, we all remember that the Court of Appeal itself uh, established a duty to disclose uh, and the Supreme Court has confirmed that duty. What worried many of us about the Court of Appeal's decision is whether they undermined that judgment by nevertheless not drawing any consequences uh, from that duty to disclose and the fact that it had been breached uh, by uh, the arbitrator in the circumstances of this case. Now, the Supreme Court has reached the same conclusion uh, that there was uh, a duty, that the duty was breached, but that they were not going to remove uh, the arbitrator in question. And so the, uh, the question we must ask ourselves as arbitration practitioners is, is whether that outcome is going to leave us in the same position as we were in before, um, i.e. that uh, there's a suspicion that as a matter of English law, somehow the duty to disclose, as now confirmed, has been undermined by the fact that the arbitrator survived nevertheless the challenge. My own view, and we, we may come to this in more detail, my own view is uh, that there is a question mark remaining as a consequence of the Supreme Court's decision. But the way in which they decided to analyze whether or not Ken Rokerson should be removed uh, was so circumstance specific and seemed to, uh, in many ways, turn on the fact that uh, 
in the circumstances of the second appointment, a preliminary issue was determinative of the case by the time the challenge came to be heard, that I'm not sure that is going to save many arbitrators in future who fail to disclose uh, from uh, disqualification um, it, before the English courts in the same way as I think they would regularly be disqualified um, before other fora in international arbitration. So I do welcome the decision. I think it has provided the clarity that we sought. And although I can understand Halliburton's disappointment with the final outcome, given that so much of their analysis was accepted, I don't think that the outcome undermines that clarity in a way that's going to damage um, English law or London as a place of arbitration. Well, thanks for that, Constantine. Philip, maybe I can come to you then. Do you, do you see it the same way? Do you think that there is now the clarity that we need or is there anything there that, um, that you have concerns about going forward? Look, I mean, I think there are inevitably going to be concerns in circumstances where what was clearly a difficult case um, has been the prompt for the decision to be made. I mean, I agree with Constantine entirely that the clarity around the obligation to disclose is very helpful. Um, I think there are obvious issues around the sort of the barriers between the confidentiality uh, restrictions in certain proceedings and the, the duty to disclose. And I'm sure we'll, we'll come on to, to talk about that later in, in this session. Um, and I think, you know, one of the factors that perhaps weighed with the Supreme Court as well, not, not only the fact that references two and three had gone away by the time the, the challenge was effectively up and running, um, but I think one of the other things which weighed with them was the question of whether or not the arbitrator could have been aware that he was essentially breaching a statutory duty by his failure to disclose um, and the, the clarity on that becoming perhaps a, a factor to be taken into account. And I think that that may have an impact um, in the future. But you know, looking at it from the practitioner standpoint, we now have comfort that there is a statutory duty to disclose. And therefore, it seems to me that in circumstances where there's a late, um, a late disclosure by an arbitrator, one can be perhaps more critical as counsel than one might have been previously. Yeah. But I think, and, and, and you know, I'm sure others will, will have a view on this, I, as party counsel, would always be very reluctant to throw allegations of a, a non-disclosure um, at an arbitrator unless I really felt there was something wrong. Um, and I think you know, in Halliburton's case, there was a clearly a genuine concern that the situation as it appeared to them at the point at which they raised the Section 24 application was such that there, there, there was a risk of material unfairness to them in the, in the process and in the setup. Um, and I think the effect of the judgment is probably to make it less likely that that will happen in cases where there isn't a good reason um, to proceed. But, but one of the other things that comes out for me is the, the Supreme Court's recognition on the one hand, Constantine, as you say, that you know, there's a particular relationship between the arbitrator and the parties, um, but the other point that, that strikes me um, is that it's not merely a sort of financial relationship, it's also a relationship of, of trust. Um, and, and I think disclosure by itself is perhaps more reassuring to um, less experienced parties or, or matters more to less experienced parties. Because I think a lot of the time as practitioners, we're picking people as arbitrators who we, we trust to do the right thing and to approach the, the, the appointment in an appropriate way. Um, and, I, and I think that's something that comes with experience um, and, and that's something for which London is very well known um, and the, the strength and depth of the bench is excellent. So, you know, it, it supports um, a, a strong measure of confidence in the way in which arbitrators in London operate. Sam, can I come to you, I wonder, on this question that um, Philippa and Constantine have both talked about so far, the legal duty to disclose and the breach of it, but um, the absence of consequences conceivably. Is that, is that something that causes you concern? Well, I, I think I agree with Constantine that, that this is a very fact-specific case, that the principles which are laid down are very, are very clear, and, very, and I think it's a very welcome restatement of the principle 
and, and the reanalysis of the principle, especially in relation to duty to disclose. But I think what a lot of um, the more excited commentators, if I can call them that, uh, perhaps lost sight of, or at least have chosen not to focus on, is that this wasn't a case about actual bias, this was a case about objective bias. Uh, and so the, the, the Supreme Court dealt with the analysis in impeccable stages. One was there due to disclose, yes. Uh, uh, two, had he breached it? Yes. Uh, what were the circumstances of the breach? Okay, they worked those out, and in particular, uh, very important, uh, uh, the fact that the uh, previous references had concluded, but also the explanation that the arbitrator had given, which said he wasn't aware of the duty. Um, people may criticize that or not, but the parties chose to accept that explanation and not to go any further to make any allegations of actual bias. And then uh, we've got the interesting timing question, the Supreme Court saying, right, given all those factors and put them all into the mix, now ask the objective test. Would a, an impartial observer, knowing all those circumstances and having the experience the impartial observer should have, would he actually think there was a risk of, of partiality or, or, or bias? No, he wouldn't. And, and so it, 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 to that extent, uh, it, it shouldn't really be a very surprising decision. You may, you may I think the problem is a lot of people don't really uh, think that an arbitrator could really have um, not understood what, what, the, what the position was. But the facts which the Supreme Court had to, had to deal with were, were pretty clear. And in those circumstances, I don't see it as a very surprising decision. If the facts are that it wouldn't actually give rise to an objective uh, concern of, of partiality, then those are the facts. But I think the really, the key, the key element, and I think Gonson put his finger on it, is that the duty to disclose has now been restated in much clearer terms and it's going to be leaving aside uh, um, the specialist uh, 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 arbitral sectors like LMA and people like that, which I think Claire may want to touch on. I think for general practitioners uh, and then international arbitration practitioners, the duty to disclose has become much clearer. And in one sense, it's been a slight wake up call. We will have to be better about disclosing things. Even those, and I agree with, with Philippa, we appoint people we trust. Uh, uh, we get appointed by people who trust us to do the right thing. But I think this helps us to do the right thing better, I can put it in that way. Claire, do you have a view on, on those points and how, uh, how this might affect industries or specific industries in particular, like the LMAA or...? Well, the, the LMAA was effectively given... The, the Supreme Court, in some respects, gave a carve-out for both GAFTA and LMAA arbitration. Um, and I think some in those sectors will might consider that business is as usual and that they're unaffected by this decision, but I think it's far from as clear cut as that. Um, it seems to me that the duty to disclose is a contractual one, not a statutory one, and it, it seems that the carve out for the LMAA and GAFTA was based on custom and we all know how difficult it is to establish custom and the LMAA and, and GAFTA had unchallenged evidence about what went on in their trades. But I think when it comes to the real life of disputes about conflicts, it may be not quite as clear cut as that. Um, so I think that, that, that it's a fertile area to what extent there is a carve out. Laura, can I just come back on a couple of points that have been mentioned? I, I, I think that on the duty to disclose, which <clears throat> I've understood that the Supreme Court has said is both statutory and contractual um, on the basis that the statutory duty might not be sufficient in and of itself and neither might the contractual duty in terms of the timing of when disclosure has to be made. The Supreme Court actually went further and they confirmed something that the Court of Appeal didn't confirm, and that is that the non-disclosure in and of itself alone could justify um, a challenge uh, and a successful challenge. And that's at 136 of the decision. And, and I think that is an important development uh, on what the Court of Appeal uh, decided. I actually found Lady Arden's description of the balance to be struck in reaching the decision on whether to disqualify here to be in many ways um, uh, particularly determinative here, because in addition to uh, referring to the timing difference, um, in other words, that references two and three had already been resolved and he knew or had good reason to think that they would likely be resolved on a preliminary issue that wasn't re relevant uh, to arbitration one. She explained the ultimate decision um, by talking about the balance to be struck between 
the importance of uh, properly sanctioning a failure to discharge the duty to, uh, to disclose on the one hand, with on the other, uh, the impact on the arbitration uh, of a challenge that is successful. And she referred to it as a balance to be struck. Um, and I think the question that that will raise for some is whether that gives sufficient weight to the apprehension of bias that may well have existed on the part of the challenging party when the challenge was made, but may have been resolved by the time the challenge was uh, decided. And I, I think that's the part of the decision that um, if I were to critique it, I think would be most susceptible uh, to criticism. I'm glad to hear from Claire that um, uh, people don't think it's going to be business as usual because I think that would be a big mistake. Well, I, I think some people may, but yes, I, I think I, more perhaps more thoughtfully, probably I would say thought more thoughtful practitioners are, are thinking carefully about their practices, also record keeping. And I think shipping firms are probably taking quite careful account of their appointment practices and their record keeping. Um, in relation to appointments. And I expect the LMA is considering whether it will change its rules. I don't know, or whether it will rely on the Supreme Court that it can't do much better than that. But I, I'm not sure that's speculation, but I expect that is being considered. Yeah, I mean, there was, there was some uh, uh, acclaim in various quarters, oh, it's all over, it's all over, we told you we were right. I, I don't think that can really live with the, with the duty of disclosure as, as analyzed by the Supreme Court. I think everybody, including trade associations and arbitrators in regular appointments in particular sectors, need to think very carefully uh, now about what the position is. If only to review how they're going to deal with it. As you say, record keeping and things like that is going to be very important. One of, one of our questioners has, has posed a, a question about the fact that um, Halliburton hadn't previously gone in heavy on the fact of the multiple appointments. Um, and the fact that there were prior disclosures about the fact that Mr. Rokeson was involved in other transocean or in other Deepwater Horizon related cases and had previously been appointed in Chubb related cases and by Chubb. Um, and it's interesting because I think in the in both the first instance and the Court of Appeal decision, there is no mention made of that argument having been run. But actually in the Supreme Court, they say that that was a point that was raised, but it wasn't the primary argument on which Halliburton relied in the Section 18 application. Um, so when, when it was a question of, of who was going to be appointed as chair. Um, and it does seem to me that I, I think that was probably a product of the fact that multiple appointments by themselves at that stage were not thought to be sufficiently problematic to be the primary ground on which one would object to someone being appointed. Um, and so it was run as a second string argument at the point in time where he was appointed, um, but actually just reading the initial two judgments, you would have been forgiven for thinking that it was a point Halliburton hadn't relied on at all. Mm. Um, and I do think that might change practice going forward in terms of those sort of section 18 type scenarios where disclosure is given and, and perhaps as a practitioner, one might previously have said, oh, well, that's probably not enough to justify an objection, um, but now perhaps it, it may be. Yeah, it certainly, call, it certainly cast a, a new light on multiple appointments, uh, and I, I agree with you. I mean, anybody reading the earlier judgments following the course up, I think that's not really what it's about, but it certainly is now. And is this, I mean, is this, is the insurance industry, I mean, it, it, you know, there, there's a debate here, and this is what led to the interventions by the various parties that did intervene. But I mean, how are we to, to look at the insurance industry? Is this... Um, as the uh, it, does it depend on it, is this confined to Bermuda form arbitrations or does this have wider application? I'm thinking of what Lady Arden said in her judgment. Um, you know, is this a scenario where we are talking about a specific industry where there are specific practices um, to be applied and disclosure is just it's just less obvious? Does I, I, this point that's been raised about disclosures being made before the appointment or disclosures being made after the second and third appointment seems to highlight precisely the point here to my mind um about whether insurance sits in a particular space where these incidents come before you know the same facts give rise to multiple arbitrations on the same issues uh, i don't know if any of you have a view on that where does insurance sit in all this simon well uh, I, I i think um it, 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 it doesn't it doesn't it sits in the same position as others doesn't it i mean 
it depends if, if you're always going to have somebody appointed. We just had a question come up now about the same arbitrator always appointed on behalf of the policyholder, the same arbitrator always appointed on behalf of the insurer. Um, is that of itself uh, something which is um, uh, disclosable? Yes, it probably is. Does it give rise to the doubts about impartiality? Well, you have to look at all the, all the contextual circumstances. Um, it, it, it very well might. I mean, if, if you have one arbitrator who's expressed very strong views on, on, on the issue twice already, uh, 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 acting with effectively for one set of allied interests, then I think it does create a problem for the third and the fourth and the fifth appointment. Uh, and then the trade associations, uh, 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 again, uh, have uh, another problem. Uh, are you always for, take a shipping example, are you always for owners? Well, th there's the less of a problem in the shipping context because there is greater transparency, because generally parties will know that there's a chain and they will know that there will be a, a common appointment procedure. And so there aren't the nasty surprises. Now it's questionable, there, there was quite disputed evidence in Chubb as to what the practice is in Bermuda forms, yeah. but the, the conclusion was that there wasn't a practice and, and Halliburton hadn't known about the common appointment. Whereas in, in shipping, where you've got concurrent hearings and concurrent arbitrations as part yeah. of the system, that it is less objectionable. Yeah, we've just had a question to the same effect on that and um i guess confidentiality plays a big part here as well philippa do you how do you see the balance that the supreme court struck in terms of um the need to preserve the duty of confidentiality on one hand and the ability to make disclosures on the other i mean look i think they they were trying to legislate as openly um as as possible to take account of these various practices. Um, I mean, I, I think there's reference in the judgment to institutions being encouraged to go away and, and make some, some rules so that there is more certainty about what can or should be disclosed. Because I think the view they took was that by signing up to, for example, an institutional arbitration like an ICC or LCIA, there was clarity and there was contractual agreement between the parties as to the level of disclosure that would be required from an arbitrator um, to satisfy those institutional requirements. And where that doesn't exist, um, the extent of what is required to be disclosed is, is more challenging. And I think they sort of say, well, high level disclosure should be possible pretty much in all cases. And that's fine as far as it goes, but it seems to me this is a classic example of, of something where the devil is in the detail. So if you go back to the parties and say, well, thank you very much. Can I also, you know, I, I should also tell you that I am appointed as uh, an arbitrator in another matter involving one of the parties to this arbitration, but I'm not going to tell you who it is. Um, or, or I'm not going to tell you, or, or, or another arbitration not involving the same parties, but arising out of the same incident. I don't think anyone from the practitioner side can evaluate that disclosure without more. Um, and so I think whilst it would be, it's a laudable aim to say, well, you can give high level disclosure without breaching your duty of confidence. Um, I think it has to go further than, than that very bare bones approach. Now, in this case, obviously, you, know, you couldn't ask the arbitrator to tell you how he decided the preliminary issues on references two and three, or even what, you know, necessarily what those preliminary issues were. Um, but I think there's, there's a big gray area there as to what is permissible and what should be disclosed and how transparent one should be in order to assure the parties that, that something nefarious is not going on. And I think I certainly, reading the correspondence, felt that there was a degree of coyness um, about the extent to which there was an overlap um, between references two and three and reference one which I think was regrettable. And I think Halliburton perhaps, you know, made some hay with the idea that, you know, the issues were on all fours. Whereas what I think the arbitrator was trying to do was to say, look, the, the preliminary issues are completely separate um, and they don't arise in both cases. And if, if the preliminary issues in two and three go the way of the insurers, then the whole thing comes away. Um, but I think if, if the circumstances had been different and the issues in two and three had been on all fours, I think it wouldn't have been okay for him to say, I'm not aware of any overlap in the way that he did. 
Well, with the, the confidentiality and um, it leads on to another question that I'm interested in, which is the anonymity of Mr. Rickson and the other members of the tribunal, actually. Because, of course, that was preserved, I should have mentioned earlier, in the Court of Appeal and in the earlier proceedings, the first instance proceedings, um, Mr. Rickson was not named, but he was by the Supreme Court um, on, on the final appeal. Um, so, uh, Constantine, I wonder if I can come to you on that. Do you, you see any issues arising out of the fact that he was named? Um, and is that something that will cause concern for arbitrators or participants in the future? Um, I think it was the right decision. Uh, I remember when the Supreme Court raised the point um, and they raised it in a way that did not brook any dissent from any of the parties. I mean, let's be honest, it was the, the worst kept secret in the world of arbitration. Mm -hmm. Everyone knew who the arbitrator was. And I, I think the point of principle here was that, that there was something a little uncomfortable about us all debating um, uh, the arbitrator's conduct. Um, with um, no confirmation of who it was, even though those in the know knew precisely who it was. And, and I think the, the Supreme Court's um, approach to that was to say, uh, this is about the public administration of justice. Uh, and if we're having a debate about this, then the identity is relevant, particularly as one of the complaints that Halliburton made was the very identity and reputation of the individual. Uh, was one of the points that was relevant to the way in which um, lower courts had decided this case. And so I think they did exactly the right thing. And um, I, I'm only surprised it took so long. It was only in the Supreme Court that this happened. Yeah, I mean, I think there was something slightly un unsatisfactory about the Court of Appeal saying, um, we're not going to disclose his name, but he's got a fantastic reputation. And that's very important because that shows that you can't really approach it, it, it on the basis of uh, an objective uh, observer thinking there'd be any, any partiality with someone of this caliber, uh, uh, and then not identifying him by name or her by name, it didn't matter who it was. Uh, and then the Supreme Court, oddly not founding himself upon the reputation, but then uh, taking away the anonymity. I, I just don't understand the argument for anonymity. And once it goes before the court under section 69 or section 68 or section 67, uh, the parties, unless it's a case where the parties are, anonymous, uh, are rendered anonymous, say in a, a versus B or C versus D or something like that, then th there may be some special considerations. But otherwise, I, I just don't see why the arbitrator should escape uh, uh, um, being named. And I think it's, it, it's encouraging, it's letting light in, uh, 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 and uh, it encourages us all to keep up to higher standards. I and mean, no one likes deciding an award and then going on a section 69 and, and, and the first paragraph of the judgment, this is a award from Mr. X, Mr. Y, and Miss Y, and Miss Z, and you go, oh, no, here we go, have we won or not? Uh, um, but we don't, we don't complain about that, uh, um, uh, and we shouldn't complain about this. I mean, there are lots of other cases where the arbitrator's been named. Take Coffley, Bingham, and Knowles, which was that case where the arbitrator had accepted, I think, uh, took 25 appointments in the last three years from the same appointing body and earned uh, over 33% of his annual income. <laughs> From those appointments, and he was named, and in that case, by Mr. Justice Hamlin Shane. Um, I don't think there's any 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 problem with that. I think the problem then comes is what do arbitrators do when they're in the frame in that way? Uh, I mean, uh, Ken Oakerson wrote a letter clarifying the position about which Philip has spoken. In the Coffey case, uh, the arbitrator, Mr. Bingham, put in a witness statement, which was then um, I think excoriated, is putting it politely by Mr. Justice Hamlin in that case, but he didn't give evidence and he wasn't asked to give evidence and he was not cross-examined. Now that I think raises a, 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 an interesting question, but I think anonymity, no, I think there's no reason for it at all, in my view, I may be putting it too strong. What do others think? Well, I'll, I'll come in maybe slightly defensively as, as an arbitrator. I think it was good that Ken Rogerson was named because his reputation and experience had been a, a relevant consideration all along. I also think it's good to have transparency and to shine a, a, a light on, on what's going on. But I would also say, be careful what you wish for in that the practice is that arbitrators stay out of challenges and that is a good thing. It means that the arbitrator maintains their neutrality. Um, it also means that it, it keeps caustic tap down, that the challenge is slightly less weaponized. Um, and if, 
if you've got the arbitrators as parties taking part, and you mentioned that Bingham, they may have need representation. The parties may not be as confident about putting their case as high as they might want to. Whereas if the arbitrator is not involved, in a sense, the challenge is kept separate. I doubt Halliburton would have wanted to cross-examine Ken Rokerson or would have gained much from that exercise. I think it would have been counterproductive. Um, it also means that judges can be probably more critical of the arbitrator than if the arbitrator is named and, and party, because if the arbitrator is named, then the, the court may feel slightly more unfair, that it's unfair to criticise them and take them to pieces without hearing what they would have said. And, and so I think there is an advantage in having a little bit more neutrality in these challenges and avoiding the arbitrators entering the arena. I, I agree, and I think I think the, the, the key is is it's an objective exercise. If you're talking about actual partiality, then that's a very different situation. But if it's an objective exercise, like serious irregularity for Section 68, or objective uh, uh, partiality under Section 24, in one sense, the arbitrator's got no business uh, uh, commenting on it unless he's putting relevant facts which bear upon it uh, 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 in the communication of the parties which seek to make things right. Um, but otherwise, why should the arbitrator be commenting? commenting, and in, 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 I went back to look at Coffey, he wasn't asked to comment, he actually volunteered a witness statement and put it in, and I think that's a very, a, a very dicey course of action, because, you know, then you, you don't, act, the situation's out of your control, you put a witness statement, and he defended himself and said it was all fantastic, uh, uh, which is plainly a very uh, uh, non-Section 24 approach, and the, the judge took it apart. So I, I agree with Claire, I mean, it, 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 I think once we remember it's objective, then you shouldn't really be, be wading in. The court's got to decide whether objectively looking at, at the facts. But if there's a relevant fact, then uh, um, you may want to reduce it. On anonymity, one of the questions that's, that's come in is about whether this, this decision undermines the issue of confidentiality in English arbitral proceedings itself. In this case, of course, the parties themselves were named. So perhaps it's a slightly different scenario, but in a scenario where they're not, and there is anonymity, is does that still mean that an arbitrator should be, um, you know, should should be uh, should be identified by the courts? Well, I had a case recently, and I didn't play any role in it, and I was the only. I, I, the challenge didn't succeed, but I was the only person named. The parties retained their anonymity, and I, I did wonder what had happened. That, that they'd chosen to sort of name, not shame me, but name me, and the parties were entitled to anonymity. But anyway, you don't get a say as arbitrator. So the practice varies. I don't think there's uniformity of practice. Mm -hmm. And I think that lack of uniformity is, is potentially more problematic in a way because you, you can't assess um, with the totality of, of the information that might otherwise be available to you. And I think, you know, when judges get things wrong, it goes on appeal and, you know, it, it is known who the first instance judge was and they, you know, the appellate levels will not hesitate to say where they think the judge or the court of appeal got it wrong and why and how. Um, you know, as unpleasant as it is for the arbitrator to, to be told that they've fouled up and why, you know, again, speaking with my kind of counsel hat on, yes, I do want to know if if someone has has got this thing badly wrong or is is fouling up in a material way that might have an impact on my decision to appoint in due course. Um, and, you know, and I think that may seem unfair to the community of, of arbitrators, but actually, you know, so many appoint so many appeals fail because the parties don't have good grounds for challenging. In many ways, I think it would augment the good reputation that arbitrators have rather than operate as a um, as something that 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 is seen as a, a negative um, for arbitration in London. And um, I mean, I know Constantine and I have, have um, exchanged views in the past about, you know transparency more generally and sort of publication of awards, for example, um, and you know, the extent to which that would build confidence in the user community um, as to the quality of what they're getting. Whereas at the moment there is an element of, you know, you get a pig in a poke because 
you know, someone's been appointed who notionally on paper looks like they fit the bill, but actually it turns out are absolutely dreadful at case management or won't take control of the issues in advance or write the, the worst sort of waffly awards. Um, and, you know, and a, a bit more transparency around the, the sort of the challenge jurisdiction might actually help in many ways to, to cement those reputations. My impression is that over the last five, five years, there's been much greater tendency to name both the parties and also the tribunals that I think compared to what was happening 10 years ago, it's quite different, that there is much more transparency. And as you say, it does, it does assist users. Um, I mean, it's all very well, the Court of Appeal can cr criticise judges, but judges won't, they're unsackable. So that is worth also putting into the equation. I think there's an added dimension to why this was so appropriate in this case, and that is that I think throughout the Halliburton challenge, there, there was a sense here that you had senior lawyers from one jurisdiction that all knew each other. And that included some of the judges mm. that were deciding this case about someone they all knew well. And there was something a little uncomfortable about that. And I think the Supreme Court took that and, uh, and, and reasoned that they needed to they needed to address that. And one way of addressing that was by uh, making clear they had no hesitation in naming the individual involved. I'm told I wasn't there that at the beginning of the Court of Appeal uh, hearing, um, each of the three justices um, was compelled to make a series of disclosures themselves about their interactions with Ken Rokerson in the past. So you, you get a sense of, <laughs> of why it is important ultimately that um, others find out who, the identity of the individual as well. That was slightly the impression left by the Court of Appeal. We know him very, very well and therefore we're quite confident that any objective person knowing him as we do uh, wouldn't think he, he, he acted partially. And I, I think that was a, left a slightly odd flavour. On that note, we've had lots and lots of questions coming in. We've answered a few of them along the way, but let's turn to a few of them specifically. Uh, a question specifically for Claire um, mm -hmm. from James Turner. Do you foresee arbitrators and LMAA references regularly being asked about the number of the number of appointments they have accepted for particular firms of solicitors? Or will the fear of offending the tribunal be too strong? Might or should the LMAA require such disclosure as a matter of course? I think um, it, it will be the user's practices. And so if p &I clubs and firms start saying, we'd like to appoint you, but can you disclose what appointments you've had, then I think the arbitrators will have to provide that information. I think probably there'll be a slight reluctance to volunteer it. I, I actually provide it, but I think a lot of arbitrators are, are sort of anti-disclosure, which was part of the LMAs case that they just don't do it and nobody expects it but I think in practice if users ask for it then I think tribunals will will have to provide it um, I think there'll be a few brave stalwarts who will say I won't give it but I, I think they'll be in some difficulty if they're asked to all right another question that's come in um, is whether the panel are concerned that the Supreme Court judgment may be more difficult to understand for those outside the jurisdiction looking in, which may in turn cause some hesitation when it comes to choosing England and Wales as the seat of an arbitration. Um, Philippa, do you have a view on that? Um, look, I, I mean, I think one of the issues that's been pointed up is the sort of the extent to which English law now appears to be different from, for example, the IBA guidelines, which would be a sort of universal, universally accepted standard, um, and the impact that that might have on the perception of, of outside parties. But it seems to me that the, the, the Supreme Court has done its best to say, look, if the parties have agreed to a higher standard um, by their agreement to arbitrate, then that is fine, and that can be enforced in the same way. Um, as Constantine said, it's not simply a statutory duty, it's also a contractual duty. Um, so I, I think actually they should be reassured um, by the fact that it's, you know, it's a pro-arbitration decision. It is supportive of the way in which arbitrations in London are, are done. Um, and it's supportive of the level of expertise and experience that resides in, in London arbitration practitioners. So I would, I would hope that it is sufficiently clear um, to be reassuring rather than sufficiently weird to be off-putting. 
Yeah, and I do, I do think there's anything really very weird about, about the, the standard which the Supreme Court applied. I mean, they made it quite plain. They were looking at the fair-minded uh, observer test and, uh, and they specifically referred to general standard 2C of the RBA uh, guidelines, paragraph 54. And when you read that general standard, it's not really materially different. So I, I, I think the Supreme Court was at pains to try to uh, 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 join the various considerations rather than say we take a different, a different approach and if institutions want to take their approach they're on their own. I, I didn't get that feeling from reading the judgment at all. I would have thought that, 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 that an international uh, um, non-UK party reading the, the, the case would actually be encouraged. But here we actually have a much clearer statement of the, of the duty to disclose. I think they might have been a bit discouraged if it had been left at the court of appeal level. Definitely. I agree with that. And, um, you know, let's remember that we have this section in the award, uh, eight paragraphs, starting at paragraph 151, which is the summary of the law, uh, which has been provided to us, which is a self-standing statement of the English law on disclosure now, uh, and is, I think, um, difficult to misconstrue. And I, th I think that this was deliberate because, you know, one of the points that many of the interveners made, and indeed the interested parties themselves, uh, to the Supreme Court was that the world, the eyes of the world, uh, was on them in this because of London's place in, 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 in the international arbitration community. Looking at it from the ICC's perspective, for example, when the ICC decides a challenge and London is its second most uh, popular seat, uh, it will look to the national law, but it will hope that challenges aren't decided differently across the world. And so one of the submissions we made is the way in which you decide is going to have an impact on the way in which challenges are decided in ICC cases everywhere. Uh, and, and it seemed to me that they were quite alive to that. So another question that's come in is about whether it is reasonable to um, simply leave the question of disclosures to the arbitrators in question as opposed to asking them to, uh, to, to make extensive disclosures of previous appointments. Um, I mean, I suppose that they, you know, this is something, it's a question on a spectrum, how extensive that needs to be, how far back it would need to go. But in principle is that, I suppose this goes back to the question of whether in all circumstances it makes part, sense for arbitrators to disclose everything that could conceivably be relevant. Um, well, well I, I, think I think that would be a quite a dangerous, um, standard because everybody stands you know what what you would regard as relevant may vary i mean the, the iba guidelines seem to me that the sort of benchmark and if there's something that stands out that's a little bit separate then you should disclose it but in a sense i think that's a useful benchmark because everybody has understands what it re broadly requires yeah and I, don't, I don't think anybody operates on the basis of it with a jolly well shouldn't it? But I, I, I don't need to disclose unless someone asks me, and that, that wouldn't stand with the general duty of disclosure. I think people ask when, when, when they know things, don't they? If you don't know that the arbitrator has had multiple appointments for a particular firm, then you can't ask, then you're dependent upon the arbitrator to do his job properly. And in our world, international arbitration, it's a world of trust. Most people, we, we appoint, and we're appointed by people who trust us, or you trust them. And you know they'll do the right thing, you expect them to do the right thing. Uh, it, you usually get the questions when the person isn't doing the right thing and you know he should be or she should be uh, and the coffee case is a very good example because it was in the market that he'd had lots of appointments but for this particular firm of of Knowles and company or whatever it was and so someone thought well he's always not acting for them so I'm going to ask some questions some very detailed questions about were asked about how much he'd earned in the last three years and all of that and you know the questions were entirely justified given what what was thought about in the what was known about in the marketplace so i think i think it depends i think if you know somebody if you know something about something you think mm, that's the tip of the iceberg that's one to find out and you may be the, 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 the answers may then clear it up no i was wrong and i think there's a risk off the back of this that we will see parties starting to try and dictate the scope of what disclosure they want to mm. see kind of over and above or or you know Sort of paying lip service to the idea um, that the the key finding in the Supreme Court is is that there should be disclosure, and I, I think what we may see even in institutional cases is parties going further than the scope of what the institution requires the the arbitrator to disclose for their own um, benefit or for their for their own 
um, satisfaction. And, um, and that I think is going to become quite a difficult process to manage um, because I think if, if some parties are pursuing it very aggressively and others are not, um, you know, how do, how do arbitrators decide that particularly in a situation where you don't perhaps have the institution to fall back on. So no, you know, if we've satisfied the institutional requirement, we don't need to go further than that. Um, and so that that is something that I think we'll have to wait and see how it plays. But that would be a concern that I would have is that, that that's what we'll see in practice. Yeah, I think we have time for just one more question, which has come in. It's, um, it's about the timing of the disclosure. Um, and when it was made and, and the importance that the Supreme Court attached to the timing issue here. What do you make of the finding that the time for judging the, the duty to disclose arises at the time of the application, or I suppose in the Supreme Court's case at the, the hearing, not at the time of the appointment? Um, and I think this was a difference between the Court of Appeals decision and the Supreme Court's decision. Uh, given that the failure to give disclosure only arose in the, later in the day because of the very breach of the duty to disclose. So the timing issue. So well, this, this ended up being absolutely determinative of the challenge. I, I think um, there's no doubt in my mind that if this challenge had been decided uh, as to the circumstances at the time of the non-disclosure, uh, then uh, the arbitrator would have been removed. I mean, effectively what um, the Supreme Court was telling us is that by the time it came to be decided, it became clear that there was no polluting of the mind of the arbitrator. And, and that takes me back to one of the first comments made, which is, I wonder whether that gives enough weight to um, the relevance here of appearance of bias, because at the time that the the challenging party made the application, they simply weren't aware of that. And, uh, and you know, one is left to ask whether the appearance of bias before the determination went one way, not the other, ought to be enough uh, to remove an arbitrator. I think many in the international uh, community would probably say in answer to that question, yes. Okay, I think we've gone through a lot of the questions, we've cut a lot of ground today. Um, and I think we run out of time. So unless anybody has any other responses to that, I think we'll end there. And I just, it just remains for me to thank um, Constantine, Claire, Philippa and Simon for making the time in their busy schedules. I know you're going back to hearings in many cases. So thank you very much for joining us and for, um, for, for dealing with all the questions and issues that have arisen today.